welcome to my channel. I am Sherilyn Dale. If you are new here, hi, hello, welcome. Over here on my channel, I generally, ch uh, bleh? I generally mess up my words, actually. We're gonna leave that in because if you were expecting this to be nice, clear, concise, this is not the place. So we'll try that again, though. I generally share true crime cases, sometimes sprinkled in with like conspiracy theories, well, more culty, problematic people and groups. If this is something that aligns with you, I would love if you stuck around, subscribed. I have recently switched up my upload schedule to about two times a week, with the exception of this week because I have a house full of Sick children, which is why I only did my makeup. I slept in this sweater. I've slept in this sweater for two days. The bun has not left my head for the same amount of time. So this is this is how we roll over here. So yeah, I'd love if you stayed and put the notifications on so that you could just get notified when I when I upload because sometimes we don't really have like a strict schedule. And I'd love to talk to you in the comments. And usually that is the first hour of the video. So yeah. Let's get started. Before we do, I have a quick message for you. Thank you to our sponsor today, Lily's Garden. If you are OG on this channel, you know I absolutely love mobile games. I especially love the ones that are like puzzles. For me personally, it's the best way that I can just kind of decompress and escape after really heavy research or filming days. There's something about like the swiping of, of the puzzles and the matching that just kind of lets me zone out, which is why Lily's Garden has been absolutely perfect for me. It's a free match to puzzle game that you can download on iOS or on Android that has over 10,000 relaxing puzzles, additional mini games. I love the little side mini games, by the way, and they upload another 4,000 games each week, I believe. So it's just never ending bank of relaxation, really. One of the things that I really like though, aside from the game aspect is the storyline aspect. It's it's quite like cheeky, funny. It's got twists and turns sprinkled with a little bit of romance. Then you're kind of going through the mystery of Lily and Mary's life. And the visuals are really good too. It kind of feels like you're kind of in there. I almost want to say like Sims-esque, like you, you see your little people and then they move around and there's just something like so satisfying about like watching it and it feel like it taking you into where you're playing, which is like the whole point of what I need some days just to escape. I also find it so satisfying to see the progress of my gameplay come to life because when you play the mini games, you earn stars and then you do your tasks. And then as you do the tasks, you get to like, turn everything nice and beautiful, like especially your garden, and you get to decide how you want to decorate it. So you have a choice in, you know, being creative, making it look your own, which, you know, I love letting those creative juices flow. I highly, highly recommend downloading it. I've been having so much fun with it. You can find the link in my description or on the QR code on the screen here. Downloading it really, really helps me out. And I'd love to hear about like your progress and kind of what theme of a garden you're going for. Mine's kind of very like whimsical. And then sometimes I wanna go back to a little bit more rustic, but I think we're sticking with the whimsical theme because I feel like the outside vision. Anyways, totally off track. I can't wait to hear your thoughts of it. Thank you again so much Lily Garden for sponsoring today's video and happy gameplay everybody. All right, let's get settled. Let's get grounded. Today we are talking about the case of Joanne Albanese. I saw this case quite a while ago and I'd forgotten about it, but I had never like forgotten Joanne's face. There was something that always, I don't know, just stuck out to me. It was like one of those people where I could just feel her energy and her kindness and her warmth through a screen, which I know sounds like ridiculous, but I'm sure some of you can resonate with that. And that was Joanne. She, by all accounts, was just a wonderful mother of two who was in the process of starting a new chapter in her life when a monster walked right into it, literally a wolf in sheep's clothing, posing as somebody else. And on August 19th, 1995, Joanne disappeared and it wouldn't be for another 11 years 
murders and four other deaths to find out what happened to her. Joanne was born January 20th, 1956 in France. Her father had a career in the US military, so growing up, the family relocated a lot throughout Europe and the United States. Ultimately though, Las Vegas became home for her and she made really strong connections with friends. People who knew her said she had this smile that made you want to get to know her and a really big heart. When I read that or when I heard some Somebody speak about Joanne and how you know like the smile just like wanting to get to know here her like that I like I felt that because I was like I always I always had remembered her face and that smile so I can't imagine what that energy would have been like in person when she was 15 she met a young gentleman named Tom Albanese and a lot of people were interested in dating Joanne not only did she have beautiful looks but stellar personality and Tom wanted to shoot his shot but he really was mentally preparing that he, he was going to get shut down didn't have a, a chance but shot it anyway and was pleasantly surprised when she agreed to go on a date with him Tom was described as a real like real go-getter. He had big goals, very successful career, and I think Joanne respected that ambition that he had and that was one of the one of the main things that attracted her to him. He, I mean, I'm not going to lie, like looking at him especially like when when they would have met in the 80s, Tom Tom was also good looking, you know? So they they were like a really cute couple. He was hard working, she was younger, he wanted to take care of her, provide for her, just give her the life that he felt like she deserved. They sounded like a really old school, traditional couple, old school, traditional. I know we say this in most videos, like traditions are changing, but married really young, Tom provided. But at the same time, like he really adored her. People said that he would just look at Joanne and thought, like I am the luckiest guy in the world to be with the most beautiful woman in the world. And that was his like daily motivation for just working really hard was just to make not just himself proud, but like her proud too. They eventually had two daughters together and that dotingness and desire to have a really memorable, successful, fun life kind of poured into making it all of that for the girls. They were also like the couple that did that for their friends too. They liked to host friends Thanksgivings and friends Christmases and just make occasions special all around. And one thing people said about Joanne was she, she could mingle with anybody. She was a girl's girl, but she could also kick it with the guys. Like everybody felt connected to her and cared by from her which was great for Tom because he traveled a lot for work so he always brought Joanne with him and you know knew that he could count on his wife to make a really good impression of, of them as a couple. It sounds like they had a lot of fun like mingling, making business connections, doing their networking but then at the same time having some downtime so that they could just vacate together which in theory sounds really nice you know who wouldn't want to just go around and travel and then be able to vacate a little bit but in retrospect when you have little ones at home it's really hard even for me I'm getting more opportunities to go and travel and leave my family and go see other places and work with families and stuff like that but it's really hard to leave home with the same sense. And, and it sounds like that time away from home for Joanne became a lot. She wanted the devotion that they were putting into Tom's business, into the family and kids. And so it got to the point where Joanne just started kind of wanting more for her life and make her making her own mark. She ultimately came to a very difficult, painful decision from what I have understood through people who knew them to a divorce from Tom. It sounds like they were still trying to be as connected as they could for their, their girls, especially Tom ended up getting a, a apartment that was only five minutes away from the house so that he could still be involved with the family and take the girls every weekend. Joanne ended up getting a really good job at MGM Grand in administration and was at the point of her life where she was feeling really excited and like she was having a sense of control finally of like, her own life and her success. So after a couple of years of kind of solidifying her career and exploring, you know, herself and just like that single life, she decided that she wanted to get her feet wet in dating. 
In March 1995, she was introduced by a friend to a personal trainer named John Edward. And this was a really fitting match for her. Joanne was somebody who was definitely a gym gal, liked to work out, take care of her, her fitness and focus on her health. John also seemed to have the same goals. He was also described as having like a very calm nature about him and was really charming. So Joanne was stoked about this new relationship. It kind of seemed like he was like a match, a perfect match for her. It was pretty quick that she introduced him to her friends and family and people that knew her said it was really clear just by looking at her demeanor and her smile while she looked at him that she was pretty smitten and had been the happiest that she was that they had seen from her in, in a few years. The girls also felt pretty excited about him. He came around a lot. He did a lot of activities with them. He also taught them how to play tennis. He was a big tennis guy. They, they did a lot of fun things together. And no one had really seen anything besides picture perfect coming from John. And then one evening, John and Joanne had gone to dinner with Joanne's friend, the woman who actually had ended up setting them up and her husband. And everything was going well. And then there was a point in the evening where Joanne's friend had made a comment about her body feeling a little bit fluffy. Just I, I think a lot of women do that, like, oh, like maybe I can't eat, I'm, I'm gaining weight or I'm, you know, not happy with, with my figure. And this drew a immediate noticeable reaction from John that none of them had seen before. He was actually training this woman. So he like took it really personally and just popped off on her. He slams his hands on the table. He's like, I'm your trainer, what is that supposed to mean? If you're not happy with your body, if you're not seeing the results you want, it's because you're not following my plan properly. Everybody was shocked. Joanne was pretty embarrassed because she had never seen him react like this. And this reaction was in the middle of dinner in a restaurant where it actually was loud enough to draw attention from other patrons who looked over because they could hear him. It definitely threw up a red flag, but she thought, okay, maybe this is just a one-off and you know he was having a bad day and that kind of felt like a blow to him. Shortly after though, Joanne's sister-in-law saw a different event that caused alarms for her. She actually was dropping off Joanne and Tom's children to Joanne and as they Joanne came out to greet them in the driveway, Joanne's sister-in-law says that just out of nowhere, John just comes like barreling up the driveway, yelling at Joanne about not answering his phone calls. And she said it was almost like that he had blinders on and didn't even notice that there were three other people, two of them being Joanne's children in the driveway as he's yelling at her. It made the sister-in-law so uncomfortable that she actually reloaded the children just to take them for a little bit of a longer drive, allow the situation to simmer down. And she said that as they were driving away, both the girls at the same time were like, I don't, we don't, you know, I don't like him. That kind of seemed to be the last incident that friends and family had heard about. Joanne said that things had gotten much better. They talked through it and it was just like she suspected, just he was going through, going, going through something at the time and she would, had now expressed how inappropriate it was. He promised it was never going to happen again and that they were going to move forward and something that she thought would be beneficial to the relationship and maybe his confidence in the relationship would be that if they would move in together. This would not only allow them to spend more time together, which seemed like they both wanted, but uh, for John to spend time with the girls too, which is what he was also saying was important to him. Naturally, as very good friends would do, there were concerns that were brought up. One of Joanne's best friends was like, okay, you know, please think about it. We support you no matter what, but you guys haven't been together too long. There have been things that have been brought up and just with things kind of moving at the speed of light, we don't want you to jump into something based on, you know, the emotions of being on good behavior because there was some bad events. Nonetheless, though, John did end up moving in. And after he moved in, that's when Joanne's daughters started noticing 
different behaviors coming from their mom. Up until that point in on the, uh, the driveway, they hadn't really seen anything alarming from John. Like I said, he liked to involve himself, do activities with them, try to, you know, be the fun guy. But they, then they started seeing a shift in their mom, their mom who was always just so bright and full of life and energetic, kind of go away. She just became a little bit more reserved, self-conscious even, and not as happy as she always had been. One of the last memories or the last memory that Joanne's daughter has of her mother is, it was August 18th, 1995, which was a Friday, and she was laying on the couch watching cartoons, waiting for her dad to pick her and her sister up to go and spend the weekend with him. And uh, Joanne was upstairs getting ready for work, and she remembers her mom coming downstairs saying, okay, sweetheart, I'm leaving for work. Come and give me a hug because she wasn't gonna see her for the weekend. And Joanne got a pretty standard kid response from that age she just kind of looked up and was like I'm comfy I'm watching TV you know I'll see you later and so Joanne was like okay have fun I'll see you on Sunday it was at 6 p.m. on Sunday that Tom dropped off his and Joanne's daughters to Joanne's house. The girls went in on their own as they always did and when they first walked in they didn't see Joanne anywhere, which was unusual. She always knew what time that they were going to be home. She was always there waiting for them, excited to see them, and she wasn't there. But they tried to just be like, okay, maybe she quickly popped into the store or something and she's going to be right back. But then as they started looking around, things didn't really seem right, especially when they looked at Joanne's room. And I guess something standard that they knew about their mom was if she wasn't home, her door was always closed. And they looked and her mom's door's open. So they figured, oh, maybe she is home. And they go and they peek in and inside her room is kind of in disarray. Like she was a very organized person, very tidy woman. The bed was always made, but this time it was unmade. There were pillows missing in her bathroom. The lid to the lotion jar was off and all over the counter. Jewelry she wore every day was just kind of scattered on the dresser. I don't know about you personally if your mom is similar to Joanne, but mine definitely is. So this is exactly how I would react if my mom's room was like this. I can, I film in my mom's house as most of you know. So when I come into the house, it looks like a show home. So if I were to walk in and there would be like a plate out of order, I would instantly know something was wrong and this is exactly how Joanne's daughters felt. As they're looking around, they also noticed that her purse and wallet were there, but her car wasn't. So they call Tom and let him know, you know, mom's not home, her car's gone, her purse and wallet are here, though we thought maybe she was just quickly at the store and her room's a mess. So this also raises flags for Tom, who's known Joanne basically her whole life. He calls her work first to see if maybe she picked up a shift and just forgot to tell them. Uh, her work says that no, she wasn't there. And then the next person he called was Joanne's best friend because he knew that no matter what she did, if she was just gonna pop out somewhere or do something, her best friend knew basically everything about her. And just hearing the situation, the her, her purse and wallet being there, the car not being there, the way that her house was, her not being there especially when she knew that the girls were gonna be there because she always was, just made like the hair on the back of her neck stand out because she's like, no, I, I don't know where she is because she's told me she's home for, you know, for drop off, waiting for the girls. And if she's not at the house, that means something's wrong. She says the last that she spoke, uh, she knew that Joanne and John were going to go out for dinner on Saturday evening. And the plan for Joanne was to go for dinner in a public space, take John out for dinner, which was actually not unusual. Joanne paid for everything and provided most of John's needs. So he, she was gonna take him out for dinner and just kind of let him know that she wasn't wanting to pursue the relationship anymore and thought it would probably be best if he moved back to his apartment. As everyone's talking amongst each other, they realize no one had spoken to Joanne at all that Sunday. 
So they immediately call the police. When the police arrive, they also see that yes, Joanne's car is missing, but even though her car is missing, John's pickup truck is parked down the street. So they run a record check on it and it comes up as not being registered to anybody. There's another red flag when it comes to John. This isn't really a good sign. So they just go with it. They quickly list Joanne as an endangered missing person. And through speaking with people who knew John and Joanne by Wednesday, August 23rd, they're able to get a search warrant for John Edwards home. It actually wasn't his home. They found out that he rented a room within somebody's home. And when the police looked through the room, they noticed that it didn't really seem very lived in, not really a lot of personal items. It was just like a, basically a mattress, some bedding, and I think like just like one dresser. But they did find two wallets that were duct taped shut. So they open up the wallets and in them are John's photos, but different names. One of the names is uh, John Patrick Addis and the other is John Stone, but none of them are John Edwards. When they run the names through their database, they discover that John Addis is a convicted felon from Alaska. Something John never shared with Joanne was that he had previously been married multiple times. He had children and he had specifically told Joanne that he had never had a family before. Not only had he had a family and children, but he was also convicted of kidnapping his children and disappearing with them for nine months. And one of the reasons why he got away with it for so long was because he basically was somebody who like would know how to do it pretty well because investigators discovered that he was a former police officer and even taught crime scene investigation. So he had this ability of having inside knowledge of how an investigation would go and was able to kind of morph into anybody that he wanted to. John Patrick Addis was born in Flint, Michigan in 1950. And he's described as somebody who was quite talented. He was musical. He knew how to play the French horn, the piano, guitar. He also did really well in school and kind of excelled in any sport that he took on. He had always been somebody that took pride in his physique. He didn't drink or take drugs. He also was somebody who loved to hunt and fish, kind of just dip in his toes in all aspects. I think he could have probably gone into any career that he chose and when it came time to enroll in college he decided to enroll in science with hopes of working somewhere in the medical field. He met and married his first wife Jody when they were pretty young and their initial plan was just to settle into Michigan and raise a family together. For some reason though, John had just suddenly flipped the script and decided that he wanted to drop out of college and wanted to pursue something in life where he could hunt and fish and be out in the wilderness more. His wife at the time, Jody, said that she didn't really have much of a say in the matter. This was what John was going to do and if they were going to be together, then that was the plan. So the couple moved to Sitka, Alaska. When they first got there, John got a job as a dog catcher. He worked for the city and then he eventually kind of worked his way up, eventually joining the Alaskan State Troopers. Alaska State Troopers? Alaska, Alaska State Troopers. I guess when they, he had first joined Alaska State Troopers, they had no uh, crime scene lab or anything like that. So John and a fellow trooper of his decided that they wanted to make improvements, make a better system. And so the two of them ended up studying and taking college classes so that they could develop a, a like protocol in this like little unit for major homicide investigations. During John and Jody's 11 year marriage, they had four children together. And by all accounts, John was a very doting father. He spent as much time as possible with them. He enjoyed showing them 
things that he liked to do in life. He was a pilot. He was an avid outdoorsman who could just survive in, you know, frigid weather in Alaska for a long period of time, which was really impressive and something that he wanted to instill in his children as well. And by all accounts, he was fun, outgoing, and he was the one who off duty was, you know, ramping his friends up, getting them out there doing crazy things like that, just like staying out at hunting. And then on shift, he was the one who was motivating everybody to get their exercise in, stay fit and healthy. But then there was also things that people who knew him thought were like a little bit odd about his lifestyle. This is the late 1970s, early 1980s. There is definitely a world that we are living in where you have modern comforts. But John wanted his family to kind of live as if they were living in Alaska, living off the grid like decades earlier. The entire family lived in a one-bedroom little cabin. The cabin had a dirt floor. There was no running water and just a very small generator for electricity. Now, Jody, who was a registered nurse, obviously could have had a really good career in Alaska, but John didn't want her to work. He wanted her to stay at home, be with the kids, take care of the house. A lot of taking care of the house was her having to haul water, use an outhouse. This is even when temperatures would drop to like, 50 degrees below zero so I can't imagine I mean some people do like that okay I can't say like I can't imagine that would have been fun I just personally can't imagine that it would be the funnest I definitely enjoy being able to have like some of you know modern conveniences but from outsiders looking in it just it seemed to work for them so who you know who are our friends to judge that this is how they were living their life it seemed like life was good years later though jody would admit to friends and family that things absolutely were not as good as people thought they were. Jody said John most definitely had control over the entire family, particularly over her. Uh, he managed every aspect of her life, who she could talk to, what she could do, when she could do that, and it eventually turned into physical abuse. Allegedly, the whole relationship just came to head when one day they were having an argument. They were actually in the car, and Jody said that she would she wanted to leave and she was so scared after saying the words out loud that she jumped out of their car. John ended up parking it, ran out of the vehicle, grabbed Jody, threw her to the ground. She was able to escape though. And from that point forward, she got away from him. She filed for divorce and he did grant it. After the divorce, John's friends out in Alaska did say that they they started to notice a shift in John's personality. He became more withdrawn. He didn't seem interested in his job anymore. And they describe it as him kind of losing his grip on sanity as he was losing his grip of having that control over his family and, and not having it actually, not you know, losing it. You lost it. He lost it over Jody, and that was presenting itself in his everyday life. In 1982, there was hope from those who knew him that things were kind of moving forward in his life. He had met a woman named Sarah. She was somebody who worked at the Fairbanks office for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It didn't take long after the two of them met to get engaged and married. And then just a short while after them getting married, John shows up to work and he just announces to everybody that he is going to quit the state troopers. He said that he wanted to go back and pursue medicine again and showed them a letter of acceptance to a school in Florida and that he and Sarah were going to be relocating. John and Sarah did move to Florida, but only five months after moving, Sarah filed for divorce and then returned back home to Fairbanks. She has not revealed too much. It sounds like she is probably has some things that she does not want to remember or recall about her time with John, but she did say that he would disappear for uh, weeks at a time sometimes during their relationship. 
He never told her where he was going. And he also became very fixated and obsessed with having his children back. He said that he wanted to take the children from Jody and he would go to whatever lengths that was, even kidnapping them and wanting her assistance. And when she was like, well, I don't really think that that's the best idea, he kind of was ensued that he agreed but was still pretty bitter that the kids weren't with him. Another thing that she learned after they moved to Florida is that he was never enrolled in medical school. He had never been accepted to medical school. The letter he had shown her to get her to leave her job and move to Florida with him and the letter he showed his friends and employers when he left the state troopers, it was a fake. Now, only a few months after Sarah left John, he began dating a pharmacist, a woman named Tony. They quickly also got married and in 1985, the two of them had a daughter. Tony's accounts of her relationship with John are also very similar to Sarah and Jody's. She said that very early on, John was fixated on having his children, would also suggest kidnapping. And like Sarah, she would say like, this is a crime. There's other ways of going about having maybe joint custody and seeing your children more, but I don't think that this is the plan. She also said that he seemed to back off on the idea, but then his next fixation became controlling her. He wanted to know where she was every part of the day. Sometimes he would follow her to work to confirm that she was working. He'd also check her odometer in her car to make sure that wherever she said she was going or where she was when she came home, like the, the distance lined up with the odometer on her car. Like, I, oof, I cannot imagine. As what often happens in these types of relationship where somebody starts kind of expressing slight things of control, this never happens overnight. It's always very, very increased. You'll have a little bit of control, maybe even kind of thinking like, oh, it's kind of cute. He wants to know where I am. And then it gets to these types of situations and most every time that control is never enough and it turns physical and that's what happened in Tony's case. She endured extensive abuse and finally made the decision to get out for her safety and her child's safety specifically because one of these attacks happened while she was actually holding and feeding her daughter and she was just like there there is no way that this is ever going to get better clearly if it's an involving now our child, this is gonna get worse. She filed for divorce. John granted her the divorce with not a lot of fuss from what I can understand. But after the divorce, he seemed completely fixated now where he didn't jump immediately into a relationship on just going for Jody to get the kids. Allegedly, Jody had no problem with John seeing the children, but he was in Florida and the children were starting school and they had a life in Fairbanks. And so she said, you know, we come out here and see them. But he didn't want that. He wanted the kids to fly to see him. And so he went to court and ultimately a judge ruled in John's favor that the kids uh, could go and see John in Florida. My bad, my correction, I'm sorry. At this time, he was in Chicago. So they went out to visit John and when it was time for their visit to be done and their mom to pick them up at the airport, she's at the airport and the children do not get off the plane. I would literally throw up and poop myself for sure if that happened to me. Instantly, Jody knew he's kidnapped the kids. Like this is not going to be easy. It wasn't easy just to ask him to come and visit them in Fairbanks. This is not a good situation. It got to the point where the FBI needed to get involved because Jody's telling them how skilled he is at living off the grid. This they they as a family lived in this, you know, one bedroom cabin with zero to no electricity, no running water. She knew that what wherever John wanted to take them, they were going to be able to survive. 8 months Eight months, I cannot imagine what those eight months would have been like for Jody as a mother went by. And finally, somebody in a gym in Montana 
recognized John. They had seen a police flyer with John's photos and the photos of the children explaining, you know, missing, kidnapped, whatever. Um, and they immediately called the police who were able to get to the gym on time while he was still there working out and arrest him. Thankfully, police were quickly able to locate the children. They were in a cabin just outside of Montana. They were unharmed. Uh, by all accounts, they seemed healthy, but they were thankfully returned to their mother. He was ultimately sentenced to four years for kidnapping his children, but he only spent 18 months in jail. He was released from prison in 1998, and he was able to make an agreement with uh, his parole and was allowed to move to Fresno, California. In Fresno, John ended up repeating the same pattern that he had been. He met a woman shortly after he arrived there, quickly got engaged, stole all of her money, disappeared, and he never reported back to his parole officer after that. And then unfortunately, the woman didn't report the theft to police, which is not something to judge. It's really common that people don't want to talk about abuse that they're experiencing. They don't want to talk about you know, theft or being taken advantage of by somebody. And so that was what happened here. She just didn't want to talk about it, didn't report it to police. And so there was no reason for police to look into John. Now, I don't know what the reason was why there was never anything issued for him jumping parole and never checking in with his parole officer, but that there was nothing ever issued and the state of California just closed his case. Now, the state of Alaska had issued a statewide warrant, but John had never been arrested, so there was no reason to find out that he who he was or if he was violating parole. So he was able to go undetected for 10 years just traveling throughout the United States. He had a multiple array of careers. He was a screenwriter at some points. He was a fitness instructor, an, a novelist, and through each city that he would travel to, he would continue the patterns that he always had. He'd meet somebody, give them a bunch of attention, just love bomb them, make them feel like they had met just, you know, the, the man of their dreams, promise them the world, steal their money, and then disappear. It was just prior to meeting Joanne that John Addis had changed his identity, which also assisted him in going undetected and that is when he had gone from John Addis to John Edwards. It was three days after Joanne's disappearance on August 23rd, 1995, which was also the day that uh, detectives were able to get access to a search warrant to look into John's apartment that the sheriff's office in Yavapai locate Joanne's gold Civic. Her vehicle was found in a very remote area off of the desert. It was an area called Little Hell's Canyon. They do a full search of the vehicle surrounding the area, but there's no sign of Joanne. There also really wasn't anything for them to go off of. Inside her vehicle, there weren't any signs of a struggle. There was nothing like broken glass or blood or anything like that. There also was a nearby shallow lake in the area, which they searched and didn't find anything. And they also combed through kind of like the, the wilderness area that was around it. But again, absolutely no signs of Joanne or any clues that they can go off of. Now, something about the location of her vehicle is that this was only three hours north of the Mexican border, which is concerning since she had gone missing on a Sunday. This is now... Wednesday, three days for somebody to get a substantial head start, especially John, who is very equipped and knowledgeable into how to last long periods of time outdoors and provide for himself. Three hours is probably like a walk in the park for him to flee to Mexico. Now, the hope was that since there was no sign of a struggle or anything like that, that maybe he had fled to Mexico, but had also taken Joanne with him. During an interview that I watched with Joanne's family, her daughters and her good friend, 
it kind of gave some insight into what that period of time is since there was no leads or signs of Joanne anywhere you're kind of holding on to hope but weeks are going by and months are going by and they described it as like each day you kind of start off the day with a little bit of hope like okay maybe this is going to be the day and that's kind of what your focus is on in the in the early hours of the day and as the day goes on and you're not getting answers then all you're hoping for is the day to just end so the new one could start and then hopefully that would be the day that you would get answers and it just sounds awful like it, it literally just sounds like you're living in purgatory you know you're just living in your own hell like every day trying to find answers feeling so helpless and I think that it's important to always always remember and think about what the loved ones of victims go through because it that's their reality that's everyday life and how lucky we are to not have to go through that as well I know that I say it on like a lot of episodes and I just, I never not want to say it. I just I want everybody to always know that these are not just stories. When we turn off the episode, when we go on to the next part of our day, whoever we are talking about, like there is a whole slew of people behind them, whole family, friends, coworkers, people who loved them, that they touched their lives and people who did maybe didn't even, but something that like resonates with them and they feel connected to them that are so affected by this forever. Kind of the next push that came through on Joanne's case was in March 1997 when Geraldo had done a segment on Joanne and was basically asking for tips of anybody who might have known or seen John Addis. And a lead had come through. Somebody said that they saw a man that looked like John who was working at a gym in Guadalajara, Mexico. Now this guy was also named John, not John Edwards or John Addis. His name was John Charles Stone Peterson. Why, why always Peterson? Why? This tipster was certain it was John. It was a, this was an extremely promising lead. Everybody was convinced this was John. Unfortunately, the manager of the gym had told John Peterson that a woman had called the gym looking for him and this scared John enough that he packed up and left Guadalajara in hours. So by the time investigators arrived to go and look into things, there was no sign of him. And the case ended up going back to a cold case and this goes on for years. The next break in the case comes in October 1998 when a hunter who was hunting in the Yavapai area, the area where Joanne's car had been found, came across some bones that he believed to be human. These bones weren't found like directly in the vicinity of where Joanne's car was. There was kind of like rough mountain terrain in that area and that's where they were found. Authorities had admitted that they did not look at that area specifically because of the fact that they didn't think that a human could carry up a body, you know, somebody's dead weight with the steep incline, especially in the heat. They were kind of just more focusing on ground search, areas that were a little bit more accessible to somebody so they didn't go up that high and eventually the bones that were collected did come back confirming to be Joanne Albanese's. I'm sure that moment was just absolutely earth shattering especially for her daughters and because there's really not a sense of closure. Sure now you know where your loved one is which is a huge part of what is so damaging and painful for family members when you just you want you just want to bring them home you just you don't know where they are there are no answers so now at least that one piece of it was essentially solved they they were able to bring her home but john is still missing after joanne's remains were found in december 1998 he was listed as uh, top 10 in america's most wanted which was huge like america's most wanted was the show of the 90s i remember watching so many episodes with my mom and so this was massive exposure for joanne's story and to get john's face out there he was featured multiple times and over the course of all of those segments 
500 tips had come through of possible sightings of him. Unfortunately, no, though, none of the leads went anywhere. And then the case goes back to being cold for another couple of years. It's not until 2006 that the next break in the case will come that will eventually lead to the finality of the case. On October 18th, 2006, in Chiapas, Mexico, which is hundreds of miles from Guadalajara, Mexican authorities end up finding the body of a woman and two children in an apartment. The woman was identified as Laura Peterson Padilla, and the children who have been unnamed were identified as her four and seven year old. Police were initially brought to the unit because neighbors had said that they hadn't seen the family that lived there in weeks, which was unusual. And they were now starting to notice like a foul smell coming from the apartment. That's when authorities had gone in, found the remains. And when the autopsy came back, it was kind of alarming because there was no physical signs of anything that had happened to them. And the autopsy report had come back saying that they had all died of carbon monoxide poisoning. But I read that there were allegedly multiple empty syringes that were around Laura's body. So that kind of leads to the suspicion that somebody might have like done something, injected something. And through the record search of trying to find uh, what could have happened, who Laura and these children's spouse was or extended family were, they find out that she's married to a John Peterson. Investigators are able to locate Laura's parents and they find out that Laura and John met when she was only 25 years old and she was actually the daughter of a successful engineer in Guadalajara. The two of them met at a Gold's gym and like a lot of the other women who had escaped from John said that in those early days he was able to charm his way into their lives and he did the same to Laura. She quickly brought him home to meet her family and her father said that at first he thought that they were just friends because John was so much older than his daughter. And then it wasn't until a short while later that he realized there was a relationship going on there. And that was around the time that the tip would have come in from the gym in Guadalajara for investigators to go search at. They said right at that time, not knowing anything about John Addis is when Laura just disappeared. She didn't show up for work. She hadn't contacted her family. Everyone was worrying about her. Her sister ended up going to her apartment around this time. And as she was looking through, trying to find signs of Laura, since the apartment seemed to pretty much just be in perfect condition. It was just like they up and left and left all of their things. Laura's sister finds a note that is written by Laura just saying that she loved them. It was time for her to leave though. She said that John had proposed to her. She accepted and that she said that she was going to be okay, promised to call her family when things were settled and she knew more about like where they were going to set their roots and fill them in on everything. But they never did end up hearing from her again. And this, they had not heard from her for nine years, they were worrying. Finding Laura and her children leads to a massive manhunt in that area of Mexico. And a couple weeks later, John Addis was found. It was a maid who found him unalived in Guatemala City. First, when U.S officials heard about finding John and that he's no longer alive. Their initial suspicion was that maybe he had found somebody that looked similar to him and had harmed them and started to assume their identity. So they actually involved the FBI to investigate, run the fingerprints of the person that they found. And at that point, it was officially confirmed that yes, this person was John Addis. His official cause of death uh, was listed as heart attack, but investigators believe that he, there was, you know, some way that he chose to decide his fate and unalive himself. 
And that kind of made me think of the fact that there were syringes around Laura's body, you know, maybe to, I, I mean, I don't know. He, he, he was quite skilled and, and into medicine and all of that type of stuff. So maybe he would have known how to make something look a certain way. I don't know. That's how, that's how I look into it. It's like, after all of that, I feel like it's just like so heartbreaking that there's just no justice. He didn't have to answer to anything that he did, why he took Joanne's life, why he possibly could have taken his his wife Laura's and their children. I think, oh my God, what a terrible storyteller. I completely glazed over the fact that those were, those were John and Laura's children. Wow, Sherilyn, awesome. <laughs> the only real type of answers that everybody can kind of have in this case is just piecing together Joanne's last conversations between her best friends and her mom where that timeline is that something most likely happened on Saturday evening when she had told her friend and mother that she was going to have this dinner to essentially break up with John. And they describe Joanne as definitely being somebody who like will stick to her belief. She's not going to be swayed. She'll be, you know, firm on what she feels. And if there had been enough that she had obviously seen from John, realizing that this is not going to change, she's not the type of person that would have been controlled and manipulated out of the decision, especially since her children are affected. Like he's, he's around her children as well. So she most likely had that conversation and when he's realizing that he cannot control her, he most likely unalived her in her home. It's believed that it was some form of like strangulation just based on accounts from other women who had been abused by him in the past. That was usually like his method of abuse. He then placed her in her car, took her to Little Hell's Canyon, hit her body, disposed of her vehicle and then fled to Mexico on foot. It's uh, assumed that that's also probably what happened with Laura as well. It would have gotten to the point where she would have just had enough. I can't imagine how isolating that would have felt to be in a relationship with somebody like that and you have been cut off from your family. That's a huge part of control with people like John Addis is just isolating you keeping you away from your loved ones and I'm I'm sure she was also thinking about her children and just wanting to get out of the situation and he didn't let that happen. It's just so upsetting like absolutely had their whole lives ahead of them. Joanne was only 39 years old and she you know embarking on this new chapter of her life that she would have you know had never experienced and was so excited for and just like feeling so proud of, of things that she was accomplishing in her life for her and it was just taken away from her. Her loved ones choose to remember and rejoice in the life that she did live though, and I think that that's important to also honor. She lived life to the fullest. She was full of energy, love, and joy, and most importantly, her loved ones want her to re be remembered as an incredible mother whose daughters now emulate that through their own families today. I am so thankful that we live in a time where record searches are a lot easier to attain. Like, do not think twice about looking up somebody that, you know, you're talking to even prior to go going and meeting them. Or if you've met somebody and they've charmed the pants off of you and you see a little, you know, a little, a little red flag, a flow in, or just that like tingling in the gut, like don't ever not listen to it. Like evil people like John Addis have the ability to just pull the wool over people's eyes. So no, you are not somebody who's paranoid. If you want to do, do an investigation, pull a record search, you know, it's very easy to attain record searches. I don't believe that it's invasive. Like for your own protection, for protecting yourself, this is a tool that today, like we, we have the ability to use to prevent people like this from deceiving us. You know what I mean? So if you ever think twice about doing something like that, you know, just remember that Sherilyn said it's okay. Sherilyn said I am not crazy or paranoid. I have permission to absolve myself of that feeling and I'm going to look into it and protect myself. All right. 
that is it for me today. If you haven't already, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It means the world to me. I love and I appreciate you so much. I want to thank Lily's Garden again so much for sponsoring to today's sponsoring today's video. Like I said, you can find the link to that the download in the description or on the screen on the QR code right here. And yeah, I will see you in the next video. I will miss you terribly until then. Make sure to love each other, love yourself, and I will see you soon.